Well, again, thanks for being here. We are delighted you come to our family service here at noon, and it's a wonderful time for us to gather uh, together and worship and celebrate uh, God's goodness. Uh, we are continuing in this lively branches journey. What, what it means to live as a lively branch as we are connected to the vine of Jesus Christ. And so that's really our goal uh, this morning is to continue this journey of what it means to follow Jesus and, and to have that healthy life that is invigorated by the power of Christ. And so one of the things that we want to do to begin with is to look at some numbers, kind of fascinating, not all that essential for you to memorize these numbers, obviously, uh, but, I, but I found them a little bit uh, telling and a little bit humorous, a little bit. So as of 2012, so I'm assuming it's updated since then, as of 2012, over half of the American households have some kind of Apple product in their home, over half of the U.S. population has some kind of Apple product in their home. Over 86%, 84% have some kind of computer. And one thing I was fascinated about is that the people that spend the most electronics, average of 976 bucks a year, by the way, are men 65 and older. So fascinating. I don't know why that is, but they do. Um, some other statistics to share with you. As of last year, 88% of people in America, the households, have Bibles in their home. And 68% of non-believing homes have Bibles in them as well. And catch this, the senior adult women are the ones that read their Bibles the most. Now, just in case you read your Bible on a tablet, doesn't mean that you actually have to hold a Bible in your hand to read it. But, but we look at these statistics. Now, all those statistics are kind of interesting, but one of the ones that I thought was most humorous was the one that tells us that of the two-thirds, two-thirds of Americans Supposedly, according to these studies, two-thirds believe that the Bible has something that, that can teach them uh, as they live their lives. The Bible says something helpful to them as they live their lives. Of the two-thirds of Americans that believe that, 10% of the two-thirds believes that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. So 10% of two-thirds believe that Noah's Ark is Noah's wife. Now, that's kind of humorous. If we know the story, we obviously know she's a heroine of France, not the, the wife of Noah. But what it tells us is there's sometimes a disconnect between what we read or even if we don't read, we just have. And we have to understand what it means to be connected uh, through, through knowledge. And we're going to talk a lot about knowledge and wisdom and learning and living. Those are words you're going to hear me talk about a lot today. But we talk about the way that we need to be doers. I want to share with you some words from M. Vernon Davis. He says this. He says, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that give me the most trouble. It's the part that I do understand and don't do anything about. So he's saying, it's not the parts of the Bible that are confusing that bother him the most. He can get over that. But the part that really he struggles with personally is the passages of the Bible that he knows but doesn't do anything about. I'm assuming that you can relate to that. I know I can at times. And one of the ways that we can understand if we are understanding Scripture is are we living that out? I want you to listen to the children of our church as they help us decide are we living out what we're learning. So watch this video of the children of our church. I think you'll find it not, on, not only fun and a good thing, a touching video, but also very, a very good reminder of the importance of knowing and doing and the connection between the both. Great. 
I don't know about you, but I like the splat part. That, that's the part that they really got into. And it is a fun video, but it reminds us of some words of Jesus. I'm actually singing the words of Jesus. And I want you to find the words of Jesus with me. You can see them in front of you. And they come out of Matthew chapter 7. So Matthew chapter 7, I want you to hear the words of Jesus as he tells us about the importance of building our house upon the rock. Beginning in verse 15. Watch out false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from the thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it went Splat, right? It fell with a great crash. He's going to tell us a story about the houses, this imagery of the houses. Before he gets there, he talks about the true versus the false teachers. The true versus the false teachers. And the analogy he uses there, which sounds familiar to us, is the idea of the good tree bearing good fruit and the bad tree bearing bad fruit. It reminds us of our verse upon which we're focusing quite, quite intensely for the next many months as we have already. And that's John 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we tie that into Matthew chapter 7, and we find out, as Jesus always speaks the truth, that you have a true good tree bearing good fruit and ba a bad tree bearing bad fruit. And we will know the fruit. We will know if it's good or bad and therefore know if the tree is good or bad on if the tree, if the person is living out what they claim to know. Are they living out the word? And so as we continue in this Lively Branches series, one of the things that we're going to focus on, and that is today, is focusing on what it means to be a learning branch. Now hear me, and you're going to hear this throughout. We're going to talk about life-giving learning, life-giving learning. And so by that, we don't mean just the acquisition of knowledge. What we mean is when I learn, I'm actually living it out. It's changing my life in some form or fashion. So we are not simply learning, we are living. We're not simply gaining knowledge, we are using that knowledge as our life changes and the lives of those around us are affected in a good way as we live into their lives. I want to draw your attention to three key verses out of that chapter that talk about this distinguishing between good and bad fruit and those that bear that fruit. So beginning in verse 16, it says this, by their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, not by the tree itself, but by the fruit. And verse 21, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So it's a doing of the will of God. And verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in to practice. It is bearing fruit. It is doing. It is putting things in to practice. N.T. Wright, a great New Testament theologian and pastor, he says this. He says, we Christians take the Bible off the shelf, read the next bit, vaguely remember something about it, and put it back again. We forget what a treasure we're sitting on. 
We really need to re-inhabit the whole story of the Bible, the whole thing. It's more than just worth it. It's absolutely life-giving. This idea that the Word of God can be life-giving is essential to the Christian faith. We, we have to know what it means to be life, uh, receiving life, and that is to receive truth that changes our lives. Now, I want to tell you a story. Some of you know this story. Perhaps you don't. And if you don't, it's an exciting story. If you do, it's still exciting no matter how many times you hear it, if you remember just how significant this event is. And so you have Jesus Christ, who is the revelation of God, God himself, fully man, fully God. And he comes into this earth, comes to this world, humbles himself, becoming man. And what he does in this journey is he reveals to us God's will. So he's perfectly God, perfectly man in the same time in that great mystery of the Trinity. And he wants to show his disciples, and the Father wants to show his disciples about Jesus' true identity. And so Jesus takes his 12 disciples and goes on a journey. Now, Jesus was often teaching as they traveled. Here's a tree. Here's a fig tree. Here's a fisherman. Here's a farmer, here's a wheat field, here's somebody spreading seed. He'd use all these image, images in teaching as they travel. And so he has a 12, but we see from the scriptures, he also has three of those 12 to which he really invests. He invests in those three more so than the other nine. It's not that the other nine weren't significant, he just pours a lot of time in the three. And those three are Peter, James, and John. Peter, formerly known as Simon. He's now known as Peter or Petros, the rock. And then we have James and John who were sons of Zebedee. We know who their father is. We also know their nickname was Sons of Thunder. That's because they had quite a, quite a temper. They wanted to call fire down from heaven to destroy people at one point. Uh, but then they become very sensitive followers of Christ. And so he takes Peter and James and John, and they go up on this mountain, and then Jesus, in the words of three of the four Gospels, say he was transfigured. Now, they, even those firsthand witnesses, struggled to know how to communicate this. Like, well, it's kind of like a sheet that is bleached beyond what we can bleach. It's kind of like a blinding light. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but it was overwhelming. Here is Jesus looking like he'd never looked before, still in the flesh, but in some sort of heavenly flesh or, or something where it's just blowing their minds. But in addition to this appearance of Jesus, they find two different characters, historical figures of the Old Testament. One of them is Moses. The other is Elijah. And so you have Jesus, and he's having this conversation with Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, one of the great prophets. Now, it's interesting. If you go back two chapters from where we started, Matthew 7, and you're going to go back to Matthew 5, you hear these words. He comes to the, to the people he's teaching, and they're expecting a whole new thing, perhaps. And he says this. I have come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Now get this imagery. Prior to that, or after that conversation, he has Moses and Elijah around him. He has, in essence, the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish those things. I've come to fulfill them. So now go back in your mind of the transfiguration. Moses, Jesus, Elijah, conversation. Peter, James, and John watching this conversation. We're not privy to what it is, but some kind of beautiful conversation. And the next thing you know... Moses is gone, Elijah is gone, but Jesus is still there. And God the Father says, this is my son, this is my boy, and I love him, I'm proud of him, I'm pleased with him. And then he says three words to Peter, James, and John. The Father speaks to Peter, James, and John and says these three words, listen to him. Listen to him. That is a great statement, a summary statement of how to be a lively branch. It's by listening to Jesus. But as we talked about last week, as we emphasize the importance of the Holy Spirit, we understand that we live in a time period where Jesus is no longer walking this earth in the flesh. So we beg the question, that begs the question, how do you listen to Jesus? Well, Jesus is the word of God who came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And the Bible 
is also the Word of God, the record of the revelation of God that helps us to say, here's how we listen to Jesus. I want you to hear the words of James, the brother of Jesus, who tells us how important this is. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Listen to that again. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James was a straight shooter. Uh, James didn't try to work his way to an argument, to the conclusion of argument. He just went straight for it. And one of the things he says is, be not just hearers of the word, but doers. And here he's saying, humbly submit yourself to it and don't just listen to it, but do it. Because if you just listen to it, you are deceiving yourselves. Now, there's this imagery of the house. And what Jesus is saying about the, the difference between the houses aren't any different, but the location of the houses are different. And the reason that the locations are different is because the carpenters are different. The builders are different. And one builder makes one decision. The other builder makes the other decision. And here's the decision. One builder says, I'm going to build my house. This, again, this is metaphor. But I'm going to build my house on the solid rock. Another one says, you know what? I'm going to build mine on the sand. I believe, based upon God's word, that there is a direct correlation between your learning and the doing of the scripture and the strength of your house, how well it stands. Notice that to both houses, as a song says, the rains came down, the floods came up, and the winds blew, both houses. In both stories, house on the rock, house on the sand, same thing happens. Rain comes, floods rise, winds blow. Rains come, floods rise, winds blow, economies recess, spouses leave, children rebel, life knocks the wind out of you, your boss fires you, something happens in life that you didn't see coming. The rain comes down, the floods come up. There's a direct correlation to how you respond to the, wind, the winds and the wave and the floods and the firings and the disappointments and all of those things, direct correlation with how well you know his word and live his word. We're, we're talking about this life-changing learning, life-changing learning. Now, 10% of the two-thirds of Americans believe that Joan of Arc is Noah's wife. I don't think God's going to hold that against anybody. I'm not sure God's really that concerned, whether you get the historical figure right. If you can't tell the difference between the Philistines and the Amorites and the, you know, all the other ites of the Old Testament, not that important. Beneficial, yes. But is it going to be a make or break it deal? Probably not. Not so sure. You, you need to know exact difference between Elijah and Elisha. I still get them mixed up. What matters is, do you know the Word of God in a way that changes your life? Back in 2001, you all know the great tragedy in our nation, 9-11, September 11, 2001. And on that day, horrible things happened, and, and we responded in different ways, some with anger, some with rejections of others' comfort, some with hero heroism, some with song. And uh, there's a man, Alan Jackson, a country singer, and, and he wrote a song and it's talking about the whole premise of the song is where were you when the world stopped spinning? Where were you when this thing just happened that blew our minds? Where were you? And the song wasn't meant to be humorous, and it wasn't. It was touching. But there is a humorous line in there, that song, that I find humorous, but also find it something that is, is very true. And I, at least I relate to it. And, and he, he says this, he said, I watch CNN, but I'm not sure if I can tell you the difference between Iraq and Iran, but I know Jesus and I talk to God. I can't tell you the difference between Iraq and Iran. And I, I, that's what Alan Jackson said all those years ago. I would echo him and say, I'm not sure I can either. You know, we've got some kind of nuclear argument with Iran and the war going on in Iraq. Other than that, I don't really know the difference between the two nations. 
Should I? Probably. Make a lot of difference in the outcome? Probably not. The importance is, as he says, but he knows Jesus and he talks to God. I want to ask you, do you know God's word? Are you, as Jesus was, the father said of Jesus, listen to him. Are you listening to Jesus? Are you listening to his word? There is a a wonderfully rich story of scripture. As I said, we need to know the details. It helps to know who the Canaanites were and the Amorites were and all these things because it helps us understand the story. But bottom line, the story is a beautiful story. Whether you read it on a, on a tablet or read it in a book, it's a fascinating story. And the story goes like this in a nutshell. You have 66 books combined together to make the Bible, the library, the collection of God's Word known as the canon of Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Hebrew Scripture and the Christian Scripture. And we go back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word in John 1, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he looks upon all things. He says, those are good. And then he looks upon creation after the sixth day and looks upon the humans he's created and says, this is very good. And then it lasts for about two chapters in our time frame, about two chapters of very good. And then third chapter, it all falls apart. And we've been in a Genesis 3 world ever since. And so the rest of scripture is the answer to the Genesis 3 world. Genesis 1 and 2 lead us into that world. The rest of the story is the answer to the Genesis 3 world, stated in another way, the answer to sin. And so you see that God is going to make something great even out of these broken people. And you see the prophets of the Old Testament. And you see the law of the Old Testament. And you see the people of the Old Testament. And God is doing something. He is moving. He is creating. He's making a great people out of himself. And then this great story seems like it's coming to a close, but it's not. Because here, in in about 2,000 years ago, give or take, you have a, a woman named Mary. And God says to her, don't be afraid, but I'm going to bring you a baby. I'm going to bring God into this world through you. And this will be through the Holy Spirit. And God, knowing that Joseph needed a little more inside information on that, or he wouldn't have, he probably bailed out. He comes to him and says, Joseph, The baby in Mary's womb is not of any other man. It is the Holy Spirit. And that baby, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus means God saves. He was born. He is raised even though he's fully God. He limits himself, as Philippians 2 says, and he has to learn. He has to grow. Even though he wrote the word, he has to learn the word. And by the time he's 12, he's an expert in the law. And he talks to the experts in the law. And then for about 18 years, because God thought, you know, just... A biography wasn't all that important to us. About 18 years are absent from his story, but we know he spent the time doing good things. And then he shows back up on the scene, according to our text, around age 30. And he comes into this world and he says to them, I'm about to change things radically. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the persecuted, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The last will be first, the first will be last. The, those who think they have all success will be brought down. Those who are seen foolish by the world will be brought up. All things that have been given authority by my Father's hand, I can take that authority like this. And he pours into the weak and the, and the sick and the down, downcast and those who are looked down upon. And he says, I have come not for the healthy, but for the sick. And he changes everything. And finally they realize this is the answer. And then we get to the book of Acts and the celebration of, hey, Jesus is gone, but the Holy Spirit is here. And the church develops. And it's not perfect, but it's doing lots of great things. Just as today, the church isn't perfect. It's doing lots of great things. And people are are coming to Christ and people being baptized and people are growing and the church is growing. But it's good fruit, not perfect fruit. We leave perfection to God, but good fruit. And then we get to the very end of the story and we find that those are all knees bow, all tongues confess that Jesus is Lord. And we get to the very end, the final chapters of Revelation, and find that the story is brought back, that the perfection is brought back. That is the scripture. And if we can dig into that and let it change our lives, then we are going to be learning branches who are living branches. I want to make a clear distinction between the knowing and the doing, the learning and the living. To help you understand that, I want to take you back to my college experience. 
Um, went on after that to other degrees, but when I was working on my bachelor's, as many of you have, we have to do a, a lot of different variety of courses to do this. And of the many courses I took, I'll, I'll give you four to illustrate my point. I took Spanish, I took Italian, I, I took physics, and I took racquetball. Today I play racquetball. Spanish, I can say gracias, uno mas, that's about it. Italian, nil. I can say gelato, other than that, I got nothing. Physics, I can't even define the word, and I'm not exaggerating. I do not know what physics is, can't define it. I did very well in college, very well. I studied, but I didn't learn. Hear the difference? I studied, but I didn't learn in those four classes. I learned a lot in other classes. But Spanish, I did it to get the credit. Italian did it to get the credit. Physics did it to get the credit. I didn't care. And I wonder if that's sometimes the case when we look to Scripture. Maybe we memorize it. Maybe we have the right answer when someone asks. But has it really changed our lives? Scripture is the tool that the Spirit uses to teach us, to grow us, to mature us so that we can do great things for him, so that our light will shine before people, so they will see our good works and praise the Father. I want you to hear about a man named Timothy. Some of you may know this guy, not in person, but you know his story. Some of you don't, so let me tell you about him. So his name's Timothy, and he is a young pastor, young minister. Now, in order to understand Timothy, you have to understand his teacher. His name's Paul. You'll find Paul's story beginning in the book of Acts. And Paul was a wonderful scholar of the Hebrew Scriptures. He, what we call the Old Testament, this guy knew it backwards and forward. But then God got a hold of him. Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, you got it all wrong. You're against me. Come join me. And Paul does come join him. And Paul goes around and he creates churches, and he checks in on those churches, and he writes letters to those churches, and writes letters to those who are leading the churches. Okay, with all that said, now go back to Timothy. Walk a mile in his moccasins. Put yourself in his shoes. Here is Paul, like the saint of the church, if you will, like this is the big wig guy. Nobody can beat Paul except Christ maybe, right? He, He is exceptionally good at what he does. He starts the church. And then guess what Paul does? Takes the keys, says, Timothy, they're yours. Put yourself in Timothy's shoes now. He now has to pass to the church that Paul started. I mean, it's like following the most important person in the whole realm of any system. I mean, Paul was it. And now Timothy has to pick up where he left off. Now, thankfully, Paul doesn't leave him out to just blow in the wind. He says, I'm going to help you out. And he'll say things like, Timothy, remember God didn't give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of strength and self-discipline. And Timothy, don't let him look down on you because you're young. God's called you into this. And, and Timothy, remember, remember this one key thing. And I want to tell you what this one key thing is by reading, because we find two letters that Paul wrote Timothy in Scripture. And this is one of them. It says, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, Timothy, here's your, here's your tool for leadership. Here's how you live the Christian life, Timothy, and here's how you teach the Christian life. You use Scripture, with, with, which is, we use the word inspired, literally God breathed, God inspired as they wrote. Timothy, this is what you need, not just courage, although you need courage, and not just respect, you need to be respected, but you need Scripture. You need to remember what your grandmother and your mother taught you. His father didn't. His grandmother and his, his mother did. His father wasn't a believer, we think, from the context. And here were two beautiful women that poured into him, and Paul poured into him, and he learned to teach. He learned to teach. There's a difference between learning 
and living, of knowing and doing. Just this past week, I, I learned some information that really saddened me. I, I was kind of blown away, actually. But I was looking into some research on New Testament history and theology and uh, looking at different um, resources. And I came across this resource of a, of a man that many people refer to as an expert in New Testament theology and history. Expert. Well, well known. He teaches at one of our universities in our nation. He teaches New Testament history, New Testament um, theology. He's also a professed atheist. Did you hear that? Expert in teaching New Testament, professed atheist. And here's why. He started off in his own words as kind of a fundamentalist Christian. And then he became a little more less fundamentalist, if you will. But then something happened to him. The why question. He says the reason he's now an agnostic atheist, whatever that means, his words, not mine. An agnostic atheist is because of the question of pain. How, you know the question. Why could God? Why did this happen? How could God allow? And because of this, this brilliant man who can quote more scripture than any of us is still teaching it in one of our colleges. But he's not living it, nor is he even believing it anymore. And so the challenge to us is to again think, not only what do I know, but how am I living it? I want you to go back in your mind to, to hear those kids singing. I, I just love that image. Two of them are mine, but they're, all those kids are just having a good time smiling and singing. Sometimes in other words, sometimes they don't. Uh, but but I, I love it. And I love the way Peterson translates one of the lines from that song that's found in Matthew 7, 26. It says this, but if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on a sandy beach. I don't want to be a stupid carpenter, and I know you don't want to be a stupid carpenter either. And the answer to avoiding being stupid at our carpentry it's not that we're going to avoid all the wind and the rain and the storms and all of that. What it is is when the wind and the rain and the storms come, that we are planted on the rock, that we are stable upon the rock of God. And so that's my reminder to you and challenge to you today is if you say, you know what, I want to be a branch connected to the vine, being a lively believer, following him, then I need to commit to being a learning branch. And therefore, I'm learning and I am doing. I'm learning and I'm doing. The wise man built his house upon the rock and it stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The rain came, the floods came, the wind came, and the house on the sand went. God 